topic of my, uh, my talk here today is open data or open APIs. Which one is the best option for a government or a company that wants to open up the data that they've gathered um, as they go? Uh, first off, I'll talk a little bit about myself. Uh, inspired by Steve Blank yesterday, I've decided to put my own embarrassing childhood photo up there. I'm Chris Metcalf. I'm, uh, I like to call myself a recovering engineer. I was a software engineer at Amazon. Uh, for the last six years, I've held a number of different roles uh, at Socrata uh, in Seattle, Washington. Uh, and uh, now I'm our director of developer experience. So all of our developer resources, our developer outreach programs, the events we go to, talks like this, it's all part of my job. Uh, I'm also, I'm an American, so what that means is right now, but everything you've heard about us is true. Right now I am extremely jet lagged, and I think right now my body wants to go back to sleep. I don't know why, because right now it's about 10 a.m. in Seattle. Uh, so most of the things that I'll be talking about, about open data and about the experiences that we've had at Socrata, will come from a mostly American, uh, North American-centric perspective. If you have experience with these same topics um, here in the EU um, or other parts of the world, I'd love to hear more input on that as well. Part of the reason I'm here is to learn on those topics too. So I'd like to talk a little bit about Socrata and what we do. So at Socrata, we're a Seattle-based startup. We're about seven years old. Um, we uh, just received a, a $30 million C round, and everything we do is open data. And at Socrata, we build software to make data more useful to more people. And, and we believe that, that each different class of user um, des deserves their own special experience. So for citizens, we build dashboards and purpose-built apps. Uh, to help people understand data. For developers, we have APIs. For governments themselves, we have performance management tools and analytics that help them understand how they're doing work. And we provide those tailored experiences depending on which class of user we're working with at a given time. Uh, we believe that greater access to public data makes cities better places to live. It helps people make better decisions. It helps governments optimize how they spend their money. It helps us understand uh, how our governments do what they do and where they spend their money and where they should be applying their resources or if they're doing the right things. And in general, the more we know about what our governments are doing, the better. And data is the best way to tell those things. Uh, and to that end, we make it, gov make it easy for governments to share their public data with civic developers and their citizens. So we try and build all the tools that we need in order to make that process as easy for the government as it is for the end consumer. And it's all based around open data. And open data is a concept where open data and content is basically resources, usually machine readable, uh, the output from government operations uh, that can be freely used, modified, and shared by anyone for any purpose. Governments are opening up this data because they want to see more people using it, they want to see companies built on it, they want to see their citizens understand what they're doing. So why are governments opening data in the first place? There's lots of different reasons they have for this. One of the biggest ones is that opening data helps make citizens and governments make better data-driven decisions. When I bought my house in Seattle, one of the first things I did was I looked at the open data that the city of Seattle provided uh, for uh, crime and spending in that area. I wanted to see whether I was buying a house somewhere that was safe. Uh, you know, I'm a data nerd, I'm an engineer. It was easy at that point in time for me because I was able to get raw data about that. We want to build, it, build tools to make it easier for people to do that, even if they're not uh, developers, if they're not nerds. Uh, we also build a lot of tools to help governments make decisions based on their data too. So we have a whole line of performance management tools uh, where you know, next time your government representative makes a promise about what they're going to do during their term, uh, we actually will help them set goals based on real data for that, uh, build dashboards so that they internally can see what they're doing and their citizens can track it too, and then back that up with data. So you can go and see uh, the data about that particular role. You can know whether or not they really are you know, reducing the number of children who are going hungry at lunchtime. Um, they also use it to source creative solutions to specific problems. Governments have lots of great ideas about how their data should be used, but one of the neat things is when, as you open up that data, uh, and if you open up those APIs, you see a lot more creative uses than you might have seen before. The, the citizens will come up with really interesting ways to use it. And sometimes the data sets that you know, that you might think are, uh, are least exciting will actually be most exciting developers. Some of the most popular data sets we've seen are things like uh, the uh, locations of dog parks or information about what uh, different politicians make. And people can come up with amazing conclusions based on that data. Uh, and another big reason that governments open their data um, is actually to create new economies and to grow existing ones. So a lot of the data that governments are opening up actually used to be data you had to pay the government for. This is data that we as citizens rightfully own because we paid for it with taxes, but they were trying to sell it back to us. A lot of our customers have found that by opening up their data, they actually give uh, businesses access to really valuable resources 
So imagine you were, um, you're a provider of some sort of service in your city and you get the ability to look at business licenses for new businesses that are opening up that m you might be able to serve. So getting access to that data can help you grow your business. It can help you do what you already did better. Uh, it also creates new economies. We're seeing over the last five years, you know, we were one of the first startups that really was in this civic space. Uh, we're seeing a ton more, and I think, I think it's probably somewhere in the hundreds now of, of actual venture-backed companies in the U.S. who are building applications and businesses based on open data. And what that does is that drives tax revenue back into the, the cities as well. So one of the goals of, that they have is, is building those companies that will contribute back to them. I have no idea how much time I'm using because the timer's not going right now, by the way. <laughs> so now let's get down to the real, the real debate uh, that is the topic of this talk, uh, which is open data, as in like downloadable raw data, CSVs, XML files, the things people traditionally think of as just raw, cracked open data, or open APIs. Open APIs is the direction a lot more governments are going in where they actually create APIs to access their data rather than just providing raw open data. So let's talk about why open data by itself is not enough. So one of the, the biggest reasons, I believe, is, is a downloaded data set is a stale data set. If you build an application around a CSV that you downloaded, you have to assume that that CSV is automatically out of date. I'm, I like this one so much that I, I actually, I'm actually i trying to create my own law, my CAF's law, so I call dibs on this one. So the moment you download that, that data file, you have to have a whole process around keeping it up to date. You know, how do you detect when there are changes? How do you merge those into your database? A whole lot of work the developer has to do. If you're using an API, we all know this, that we're an API conference, then you don't have to worry about keeping that stuff up to date. So you don't have to have those assumptions. Another big part of it is you don't want to make civic developers build their own APIs. Um, one of the, the things I hate hearing when I go to hackathons or when I talk to civic developers, especially when you know, it, it comes to data that, that we don't host or that we can't actually help with, is, oh, I'm going to download this, you know, this million record CSV file, and then I'm going to put in Elasticsearch, I'm going to build all this framework, and I'm going to build my own API. When you're already providing that online as open data, you shouldn't have to then go build a whole second system to host it on your own. If you provide an open API on that data, it's a whole part of that app that the developer doesn't have to make. You know, imagine you have, you know, we're, we're in this room, we're all people who know how to build APIs, or a lot of us are. Uh, if you're you know, just a, you know, a weekend mobile app hacker, you have no business building your own API. Like, that's, that's how we get really screwed up APIs out there. But um, if the API already exists, you can tap into that without having to build a whole separate uh, set of tools that you don't really understand how to build right. Uh, it also makes apps more sustainable and portable. If you think about that, that mobile developer case again, if they're not managing a whole back end on top of their front end as well, uh, it's going to be a lot easier for them to make that app something that's sustainable. If somebody else is providing the, that back end service for them as an API, that's something that they don't have to do. It can also make apps more portable, and this is something we're trying to do at Socrata as well, is by uh, providing APIs on top of this data, uh, you can build apps that are more portable across cities. So we're helping our cities develop lightweight standards. We're basically using the Socrata API and a lightweight schema for the data. You actually end up with compliant APIs across those different platforms. This makes it easier to port those apps between different sites. So why not just APIs? Why don't we just skip the providing of bulk data entirely and just provide APIs for everything and make that an API first strategy? Everybody talks about API first, API first. Um, there's, some fall, there's, there's some failure points in there too. One of the big ones is when you create an API, um, especially if you build an, build an API for performance around data, you are building a gate. You're building a fence with a gate around that data and you're prescribing one way or a set of ways to access that data. Uh, and that is limiting for some use cases. There's going to be, used, like, no matter how hard you think, there's going to be some use cases you can't support, right? Like, at Socrata, we've tried to create the most generic API we can reasonably with the performance constraints we have on top of the data that we provide, but that still is a limiter for some people using the data. So that gate prevents people from using it. Another big thing is that APIs go away. And everybody here, we're all familiar with you know, that there are businesses that shut down their APIs and they cause problems. You know, Netflix shut down their API and there was a, there was a, a cascading effect across, you know, all these, these uh, apps and businesses that were using that data. And that sucks. It sucks when that happens. 
It sucks even more when that happens with open government data because that's actually taking something away from the public. Like a little bit of, of that, you know, that relationship between the, the government and the citizens goes away. Uh, so one of the great things that you can get from having uh, downloadable data is there are organizations out there that, that are caching that data. There are, um, there are open data organizations that are constantly crawling our websites and just snapshotting it and sticking it in an S3 somewhere just for that rainy day when that government decides to take it down. Uh, because, you know, that could be the next, it's not a Snowden moment, but it's a case where the government was sharing something, they take it away, we, we should keep that data around. So providing a way for people to get the data in bulk allows them to, to keep that archive copy. Uh, you also can't anticipate every single use case. So like our APIs, we build them to be great for, you know, the gen general query case where you're building, you know, live applications on the web. It's not good for big data. There's, there's lots of use cases where um, having that bulk data allows somebody to do something that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Uh, you can analyze historical data instead of just looking at the latest results. You can keep your own snapshots of it. You can do lots of interesting things that you couldn't do if you just had a, uh, just an API on top of that data. So our solution was, why not both? Let's do both open data and open APIs. This may be a very US-centric meme, <laughs> but I think it's great. Um, why don't we provide both open data and open APIs at the same time? So all of our data sets on Socrata are available via our uh, Socrata APIs, and they're also available in bulk downloadable formats. So you can get the whole data set as a snapshot, download that, put it, do whatever you want to do with it, um, and you can also use an API on it. So we get the, be the benefit of both worlds, and it's the same data for both, and they're relatable between the two. So you, it's very easy to understand how they relate in that way. And we found this to be very successful with our, with our clients. So some of you out there might be saying, but I'm not a government, how does this idea of, of open data combined with open APIs, how does that apply to me? I think there's lots of actually interesting parallels uh, for you know, commercial APIs as well on top of this. So one of the big ones is opening up your API specification. So one of the things that we've done with our API spec is we've made our entire API spec Creative Commons so that people can create their own compliant implementations of it. We're actually making our whole API server stack open source so that if we go away for some reason, if we run out of money or we get bought and somebody shuts us down, um, individuals or organizations can set up their own compliant servers that comply to the same API specification. There's a great project by Ken Lane from API Evangelist called API Commons, where he's trying to make this into a common practice for all APIs. The real value in your API is not the schema of the API. Like, we spend a lot of time thinking about that. We put a lot of energy into it. The schema is the way you access the data or the business model behind it. So there's nothing that detrimental in opening up your API schema, and we can all basically build off those common, uh, those common standards when we build our own APIs. Another big way that we can help with this is letting our users keep their data. So it depends on your business model. Uh, you know, it, it, if, if that data is, is something really valuable you need to keep locked down, maybe that won't. But if it's data that they create themselves uh, or it's data that is only uh, temporally valuable, you know, if you're uh, providing um, data about traffic, for example, that traffic data is most valuable probably at the exact moment than, th than when, it was, when it was logged. It's going to be less valuable, you know, 20 minutes from now, an hour from now, something like that. So if you can use creative licensing to make it so that, um, that when someone using your API can keep that data around longer, a great example is like geocoding. You'd be, it's very, very difficult to build applications on top of geocoders because most of the, um, the geocoders, like the Google geocoder, for example, won't let you keep that data around to use for other purposes. If we had more APIs that allowed you to um, do things like geocode an address and then use that in creative ways, you'd see neat use cases on top of that. But because of the licensing, a lot of those things kind of get squashed. So the more we allow users to keep their data around longer, I think the better. Uh, another great way you can do this is through creating a partner data program. If you have a case where, um, where your data is really, really valuable to you and it should be something that people pay for, uh, you can create a partner program where people can get access to it. One of the neat use cases I've seen of that, which is very small, you can barely see it, um, is the eBay market research program. Um, when I was at 
uh, the eBay Live conference, the developer conference in like 2006, I think it was, like in the dark ages of APIs. They had already announced they had a, a uh, JavaScript API, because everything there was JavaScript APIs, a JavaScript API for getting pricing data, so you could get like what the last sales price of a Beanie Baby was. Um, and you could use that in, a, in kind of a limited gated fashion to pull back pricing data. Uh, but some people wanted to do bulk analytics on that to maybe see like what the pricing history of Beaning Babies was for the last you know, five years. And that data was super valuable to them and to eBay. So they had a special program where you could buy that bulk data. So it still allows people to get access to your data. Maybe they have to pay for it. And now they actually sell it through a, a third party which puts analytical tools on top of it. So same kind of thing. So there's somebody getting access to the data so you can get the bulk analytics on top of it. Uh, so I'm actually going way, way faster than I anticipated. But one more thing that, that I have to, <laughs> that he's excited because that means we can keep it on track. Slow down. I'm good? OK. Well, I'm almost out of stuff. So one more thing that, that they would be unhappy with me if I didn't come and, and pimp here. At Socrata, we're hiring. So now that we just have, we got 30 million more bucks, we can hire a lot more people. Uh, so we're hiring uh, all over the US. I know a lot of you guys are, are here in the EU. But we're hiring for tons of positions in the US, as well as a few positions here in Europe. Uh, we also have remote employees in a lot of places. So if this is the kind of stuff that excites you, um, you know, please look us up uh, and see uh, if maybe there's something we can do together. Cool. Thank you. And now we have lots of time for questions. Yeah, we have time for questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have time for question here. Who works for civic public authorities in the room? Who has a business that where you use civic data in some way too? A lot, a lot of people, companies don't think of themselves as open data companies, but they use that data in some way. Okay, yeah. we got at least one in the front. Yeah, some open data here, here, here. Uh, I, I may have a first uh, first question for you about uh, uh, about it because I've made a small m m market study that I kept for me. Okay. Uh, no, actually, I made a blog post out of it, but I didn't sell it to anyone. I preferred sharing it by a blog post, and it was with few French big corporations that, open, that were opening open data programs. Mm -hmm. And mostly, they often say that we will not jump into open data because of the license. And they told me, for, since 10 years, everybody, every consulting company comes to say, your data is gold, is uh -huh. the gold mine, is the next oil and everything. And now you ask me to release it for free with a free license and to everybody. So is it valuable or not? So what they did, they released really low value data. Mm -hmm. So it didn't work because the value first, right? If it has no value, even it's... So they say, and, and this, you know, this is the non-virtuous circle, you know, because they didn't convince internally. And so then don't talk about, about APIs. They released data with no value. Of course, no one's going to find it valuable, so nothing happened. Yeah. yeah, nothing happened. And the open data, some part of the open data bubble, you know, so the hype goes really down yeah. you know, after this, at, at least in these big corporations. So did you see it in the US? So we, we've seen that in some cases with governments where they, you know, the first data sets they release are the ones that are relatively uninteresting. Um, we don't normally have the licensing problem when it comes to governments. Um, where you know, uh, you know, one way of solving that licensing problem for a corporation releasing that data where they want to retain some of the value for it is to use a license like the Creative Commons uh, non-commercial license. You know, so you can open up you know, data about your operations, for example, so that researchers can use it or the press can use it, but you can't build a business on top of it. But, but the, 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 the open data community will say it's not open data. You see? Correct. That's, it's kind of on... I, I, uh, my belief, at least my personal belief, and I think the belief of a lot of our company is that the, at least getting the data out there for the citizens to use, for the, in, in, the gov in the corporation case, it would be for their consumers to use, that's a really valuable step. So if, if it is a little limited, it's better than nothing. You, know, like you can still get that data, you can still make discoveries on top of it. Um, if there's a route to, like one of the things that I, I always push for in that case is like as long as there's a route to getting the data to be used for a commercial purpose. Like if you have a, I was actually talking to someone a couple days ago about exactly that. They used a non-commercial license for their data, but they, they uh, amended it to include a clause at the top of it, which basically said, if you want to use this for a commercial process, but a commercial purpose, contact us here, you know, and we'll you know, give you terms or something like that. So at least there's a path to using the data for commercial Because, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but for uh, open data, like let's say a CSV file, you cannot track it. Once it gets out, you cannot track it. 
Same thing, same thing with an API, too. Like, yeah. if you're an API provider, all you know is somebody at an IP address with an app token is requesting your data. Like, you, you do not really know how they're using it. Yes, but you can control rate limits, you can throttle it, you can at least, uh, you know, see it coming, right? Yeah. You know, uh, I, um, the Google, uh, Tor Mitchell from Google in, in San Francisco used to make a call, uh, talk on that about how he, they avoided with Google Maps to have all Google Maps cached by third parties. Through throttling. Yeah, through throttling. Through, through throttling. Yeah. Well, in my opinion, if, if you're putting up an API, putting up, if you're just putting up an, up an API to access your data, it's not open data. So at that point, you're not doing open data anymore. I think the best way to do open data is to combine raw data with APIs. Uh, but if you're just doing APIs, it's not, you, you have an open API, but you do not have open data. So it's, it's like, f let's say, um, free food, but with a better service, is that? Maybe? Free food with better service, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's still like free food. It's not paying food <laughs> right now. Is it? Yeah, you're still, you're still not paying for it, but, but you get more usability on top of it. Like when you, when you use one of our open data APIs, for example, you, know, you get the same content as you would get from the CSV, but you can, you can filter it, you can query it, you can do the kind of things you expect from an API. So it's the first, it's eat with your hands, and with an API, it's take a fork and a knife. So Crada, we sell forks. <laughs> we yes. sell forks. <laughs> yeah, GitHub too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah what's that? GitHub we, too. We, yeah, GitHub too. Yeah. Well, yeah, GitHub similar model. It's it's you can get a lot for free, but when you want something special, you, you pay for that difference. Yeah. yeah. Does w someone wants to add something on Open Data? Yeah. Hey, thanks for being here. Um, <coughs> I was wondering, to what extent can you trust the data? This data released by governments. The, what, how, how much can you trust it? Yeah, I'm not saying that. Yeah. Forging data, but it's easy to just omit some numbers and that's, stuff. That's part of the process, is you kind of have to trust the government that they're providing all the data. Uh, the governments do, like, most governments that do open data well will have a really well-defined policy on what they're going to omit from the data. You know, so most of our customers that have, have mature open data programs, they'll always have, like, a data policy document, which says things like, we're going to release, like, business licenses, for example. Great. Business licenses is a great example. Um, business licenses... City of Seattle, um, they release all business licenses, but they omit the home addresses that might be associated with a business license, and there are particular kinds of business licenses that they don't release for safety reasons. Like if you're a hairdresser, your, your, your business address is your home address, so they just omit those entirely in order to protect those people. But they're really specific about what they omit. And at that point, it is a trust thing. You do have to trust and make sure that they're releasing the right thing. The other good side of open data, though, as well, is is because you have all the data, uh, you can analyze it and you can, you can figure out if they were releasing all the information. So like, if a government is releasing their budget data and their spending data, you can look at the spending data and you can be like, okay, the budget said you had $100 million, but your spending only records $90 million and there was no surplus, so where'd that last $10 million go? So that kind of stuff you can find. But you know, it's, it's uh, one of the sayings in the open data is uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant. So it's like the more that you get out there that people can see, the better. It's the kind of the open data equivalent of, you know, um, you know with, with, with many eyes, all bugs are shallow. Same kind of idea. Thank you. Thank you. One more question? Because I have a great one. <laughs> no, no, but actually, if someone want to ask a question, yeah, so be free. Uh, we, we still have time. Um, um, so Socrata has a kind of de facto monopoly on, on open data in the U.S. with public authorities, right? So uh, you don't have all of them, yeah. but the one that, that have an open data, open API platform is often Socrata. If they are using a commercial platform, it is, it is almost certainly Socrata. Yeah. A, I mean, there are some other companies like Junar, there are some companies that are doing um, like hosted CCAN instances and stuff like that. You know, but if, if it's if it's yeah open data platform, that's that's generally yes. So do you see a virtual cycle about if one uses Socrata? You know, you talk about API commons. Yep. So do you see a beginning of virtual cycle because your interface are probably quite looks like mm -hmm. for an API for let's say a point of interest, maybe probably the same with another city because it's Socrata and everything. So do you see it? Yeah, and we are, we're already seeing some of that. Yeah. Okay. So we, one of the things, the, one of the benefits that we have. One of the things we struggled with a lot when we were smaller uh, was 
getting getting governments to release the data in the first place. Like they didn't see the justification for it. It was really really hard to convince them to do it. There was a lot of hand wringing and I don't know. I'm scared kind of stuff going on. But the more um, the more governments that open data, the more that open data through our platform, or that you can see examples of it, the more data gets open. There's that virtuous cycle. And the other virtuous cycle is you know the kinds of data and the the, the schemas of data. So we are seeing uh, adoption of. We we don't want to you know, get into the capital S standards business, like just holding standards boards all the time on things. But what we're creating are these lightweight standards where if you want to release budget data, um, we're finding more and more cities releasing it in the same formats because they have examples to look at. And then there are applications on top of that. Yeah. So you, if you get the virtuous cycle basically is you've got some open data in a schema. So somebody builds an app on top of it and another city wants to open up data and they want access to that app. So they release the data in that schema. And then the more that cycle goes, the better. And we've actually started a program that we call the Open Data Network, uh, which is basically a, a, a program to encourage that kind of cycle uh, and also to get, get businesses involved. So for example, uh, Yelp has started uh, consuming restaurant inspection data in the US, uh, where basically if you go to Yelp in San Francisco and you look up a restaurant, they'll tell you the, the safety rating of the restaurant. So as we get corporations involved in that too, that's another motivator for those, those governments to share their data in those formats. So the more of those that we can get, the more of that stuff that we can provide. And do you see internal usage? So when they release an API for external purposes, <laughs> do you see some governments or, or public authorities that say, oh, actually it's useful internally? Do, do you see this coming or, or we no? We do. We actually see a lot of uses of that. So one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about Socrates is so every data set can have, you can have a public data set or you can have a private data set. Something like 20 or 30 percent of our data sets actually are private. So a lot of governments use our platform for internal data sharing, just to share data between different sub-agencies or departments. You know, when the water department needs to know where all the schools are, they don't have to go, you know, through the whole bureaucratic process to get the data anymore. Um, and we also see a lot of use of our APIs, those same open APIs that citizens use, the government's are using to build apps too. So one little known fact that, so everybody here is probably familiar with healthcare.gov, the horrible failure in the US. Um, we actually had a small part in the resurrection of it that I think is pretty cool. Uh, the US uh, Health and Human Services, when they were looking to you know, kind of put something up on healthcare.gov so people could still get some value out of it and understand what their healthcare was going to cost, They loaded that data into Socrata. They used Socrata's APIs to build a single page JavaScript app where you could look up what healthcare would cost in your area given your you know, age and health constraints. So we're seeing lots of internal use of our APIs by governments to build uh, applications in a, in a much quicker way than they did before. Instead of paying, like that, that app would have probably caught, taken them six months and cost them $200,000 to have you know, some you know, huge government contractor build, but they built it over the course of a weekend using the Socrata APIs. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.